is a visiting postdoctoral fellow at our Newcastle City Studies Centre from Sweden. Thank you. Thanks, Anne. Um, let's see. Sorry. Um, all right. I feel like I needed a box to stand on here. I'm so like, I'm so short. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, thank you, Julia, for the presentation. Um, yeah, so my name is Anne and I'm visiting here from the University in Sweden. Um, I would also like to start to um, acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the lands in which I work, live and play, both back home in Sweden, but also here in Australia. And I recognize that First Nation serenity was never ceded when Sápmi, the land of indigenous Sámi in the Fennoscandian region, was colonized, nor was it here when Australia was founded on the genocide and dispossession of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. This always was and always will be Aboriginal and Indigenous. Um, something short about the context um, for my research. So this study took place in the northern Sweden, in the county of Västerbotten, uh, close to the Arctic Circle. It's a pretty sparsely populated area, and by chance, I ended up doing research in two rural towns here, with a population around two to 3,000 um, in each of them. And here I came in contact with two leisure organizations with activities for young people, where I did some photo elicited uh, focus groups, and some observations when, uh, within a total of 16 girls between 14 and 17. So a bit of a younger um, group of um, young people than our previous presentations. And this generated a couple of articles in my PhD thesis uh, on how girls perceive and construct places of youth leisure as social factors of youth mental health. And this, was, this data was connect, uh, collected before uh, the pandemic. Um, yeah, coming from the field of public health, I might be a bit of an odd one in the list of today's interesting presentations. But when I did my PhD project on young people's mental health, stress and the role of leisure, it became clear that the relationship between leisure and health was very complex. Not only did I find how different forms of leisure increased levels of stress and poor mental health, but leisure also played an important role in the imagined future transition to higher studies and work, and in the construction of a successful self, both today, but also in the future. There are numerous theories on what leisure is and how we define it. And traditionally within leisure studies, leisure has been defined based on what it's not. So it's not work, it's not school, and it's not domestic work. Um, it's time free from the numerous obligations and responsibilities of these above mentioned. But this had also been criticized by feminist scholars pointing to the complexity of everyday life, where especially women's times are much more uh, mixed. Class is another important aspect of leisure, where leisure has been defined as the consumption of non-productive time, but also how the frenetic pace of work and now also the frenetic pace of leisure um, <clears throat> drives people to pursue and consume leisure with an eye of maximizing the goods and experiences they can afford, but also sometimes what they, what they can't afford. Um, leisure has also been defined as a form of labor, emotional labor, much in contrast to how we see leisure as free time and freedom. These days, much of youth and adult leisure is digital, blurring the temporal and spatial lines of leisure and other parts of life. But leisure is also now increasingly seen as time that should, be, that should generate outcomes in terms of knowledge and skills. And here I draw on the concept of leisure precarity to capture this shift in the meaning of youth leisure and how young people now can fear this empty and unproductive time and instead perceive leisure as a future investment geared towards employability through CV building activities, networking, developing skills that will be relevant in a precarious future uh, educational and labor market. But this concept is, of course, also marked by class, ethnicity, gender, and so on. Okay, um, so let's visit one of these towns where I did my research, where Vanessa lives. Um, and this picture is also taken by Vanessa, visualizing her feelings of being stuck when you run late for the bus and the next one leaves in two hours. Here's a quote by Vanessa. So I think this 
uh, quote, mirrors the dominant discourse of the rural environment as a dull place, a teenage wasteland offering nothing for young people to do. And as Vanessa describes it, even though there are things to do, it feels like there's nothing to do here. But at the same time, other narratives contradicted this representation because their leisure activities in which the participants themselves were engaged in were described as taking up all of their time outside school and homework. And Erica, who also described her hometown as a place offering uh, absolutely zero for young people, was on a volleyball team and had practiced three times a week and playoffs during the weekend. She told me, if we have a game on, say, Saturday, but not on Sunday, then I'm so exhausted. I just have no energy to see anyone on Sunday. I'm just so tired. I just want to rest. And Jennifer from the same club, she said, when you have this many practices, it gets very stressful with school. And trying to find a balance between it's all, uh, it's, it's pretty difficult. It's really difficult. So this illustrates the tensions between how the participants reproduce this dominant discourse we all know of reality as a dull place, but also contrasting them um, with their own experience of leisure as something very overwhelming and stressful and demanding in addition to uh, achieving in school. Um, but what this paradox tells us is that young people being busy is not a denial of this representation of rural places as wastelands, but a reaction to it. Young people keep themselves busy with what's available, but also to position themselves as active since being busy is a marker of success. But not busy with anything or with whatever. In our conversations, it was clear that some leisure activities sports above all, were very positive and good for young people, while other types of leisure were not, as the conversation between myself and Camilla shows. And Camilla was part of a small riding club in one of the towns. So here she mentioned like gaming uh, as, you know, kind of the activity you do when you're by yourself at home and being isolated. Um, it's so a positive leisure was perceived by the participants as physical, away from home, away from the screens, social, doing things together under, under adult supervision, and not least encouraging responsibility taking. And this thing with responsibility taking was repeated as some kind of mantra in the, in the conversations with my participants, how important it is for young people to learn how to be responsible. And responsibility has been described by Beverly Skeggs and others as one of the key signifiers of respectability and how women through care and obligations invest in and perform class and gendered subject positions. And I'll let you read this extract from the conversation between Malin, Veronica and Lisa. So here, leisure is not only represented as providing opportunities for self-improvement, but the participants also position themselves in contrast to a more generalized, non-responsible other teen who would not get up in the morning uh, on a weekend to help out. And Veronica also mentioned how they learn skills such as leadership and stuff like that, um, meaning implicitly that this was something good and something useful for them inside and outside the context of leisure. So of course the participant talked about the leisures of being fun, they're being social, they see your, they, uh, you can go and see your friends, you get some exercise and so on, <clears throat> and having their own place to hang out. But they also constructed leisure as a context to gain useful skills and competences for their personal development and future in an effort to remain active and do something productive. And as I see it, the conditions of precarious leisure are closely associated with the discourses of individualistic and successful femininity, constructing leisure as arenas for self-fulfillment, development, and empowerment. Aligning with a neoliberal gendered subject position where you should always strive to improve yourself in relation to both your health um, and your skills um, in order to maintain a, a competitive but respectable femininity. The responsibility taking was also extended to the survival uh, of leisure in rural areas because these two rural towns were very much affected by the dismantling of public and private services 
including also leisure and recreation. And here is a quote by Lisa saying that we do everything for the club. If we left, the club wouldn't exist. And this thing with leaving was also something causing worry and feelings of guilt. Because when you start upper secondary school in Sweden, in this part of Sweden, this transition implies long hours of commuting or moving away from home. <clears throat> so the precariousness of rural spaces aligns with the prevailing discourses on active citizenship, where citizens now take on the responsibility for services that were prov previously provided. So the participants in this study were contributing to the social economy and supporting the sustainability of these rural places through unpaid labor. Yeah, and then a little bit of a short summing up. Um, so the starting point um, was the reproduction of this very well-known uh, dominant discourse of the rural dullness and efficiency. But this taking for granted knowledge that young people have nothing to do stands in sharp contrast to how demanding and stressful the participants constructed their own leisure to be. Because despite the girls' experience of leisure as overwhelming, they still saw it as positive. They still wanted to do, you know, have the many exercises or many practices a week and so on. Because being active and being and doing stuff is good for you, as long as this leisure is characterized in a certain way. And here the concept of precarious leisure came into play. That leisure should be fun and social, but it should also be able to acquire valuable skills for current and future educational and employment trajectories, such as becoming a responsible subject. In contrast, hanging out at the local youth club where young people can spend time after school under the rather loose supervision of adults was not constructed as positive leisure. But for leisure to be uh, something you can benefit from, certain organizational structures need to be in place here. But in this context, in this rural context, these structures and services might be few and far between. So the responsibility to sustain places of leisure feed into the discourses of ambitious, respectable and successful femininity. So this effort can also be argued to be a form of emotional labor and an arena for additional responsibilities to be carried out by the girls. So the participants created their own emancipatory places of leisure, but they also reproduced gendered and class subject positions where girls should be both responsible and respectable in pursuing su successful femininity. So from a gender perspective, leisure precarity becomes another arena of consumption where the ideals of competitive femininity can be incorporated and reproduced through the praising of girls, development of skills, strength, health, and so on, independence. But how about the young people who don't have access to these arenas for developing social capital? Intersecting inequalities in relation to class, racialization and location affect young people's access to leisure. And these intertwining structures result in persisting inequities and lost opportunities to benefit from leisure, such as building social capital, crucial today for successful youth transitions. So these structures need to be recognized together with the power in, the, in, in shaping the young people's lives as well. And just to say that as a comparison, we did another study with unaccompanied youth, mostly boys and young men from Afghanistan, now living in rural areas in Northern Sweden. And their stories very much differed in terms of the role and position in the rural communities and who belongs in what terms. But they also feared unproductive time, both in terms of lost income and educational skills, and as a threat to the chances of staying in Sweden, but also as a threat to their mental health. <clears throat> 